Um, so let's uh, welcome all of the Emeriti members of the Emeriti Association here at UCSD. I'm Jake Jacoby, president of the Emeriti Association for this year. And I'd like to uh, welcome everybody for the March meeting. I think uh, a lot of people have gotten excited and are having a newfound spirit of being able to think of a future from this pandemic as people, uh, more and more people are getting their vaccinations. And as you know, the CDC has just in the last two days, two days ago, come out with new recommendations for activities for people who have already been fully vaccinated. And those kinds of events can be found on the cdc.gov website. When you track and click all the buttons that say vaccines and you will come to their new guidelines, which actually are, are very exciting because it means that people can meet with other people who have also been vaccinated indoors without necessarily having to wear masks. Um, and although the limitations are still uh, for not having large gatherings indoors or outdoors, but small gatherings, uh, particularly with your family, uh, are now considered to be okay, meaning that they're very low risk compared to the kinds of risks that were present in the past. So that's a real progress in fighting this pandemic. We have um, just concluded our executive committee meeting and reports from our committees. For those of you who are Maritime members who might actually be interested in becoming mentors of our undergraduate chancellor scholar students that have never really thought about it in the past, but but you would like to share your experiences, then we are uh, always welcoming of new mentors into the program. And so you should contact Suzanne if in fact you have interest in this program. If you'd like to discuss it with me or with the mentorship director uh, uh, at, the, uh, at your leisure, that would also be an appropriate approach. Uh, the program for today is going to have a wonderful topic. It forced me to go look up what the subject of the topic was, and I was happy to find out about it. But the speaker is going to be introduced by our current vice president, Stephen Adler. Thank you, Jake. Hi, everybody. Um... It's my pleasure uh, to introduce our March. I had to think for a minute this <laughs> whether that was the right month. It's all sort of blurring right now. Uh, our March speaker, who's been very gracious in um, uh, agreeing to uh, make a presentation for us today, is Professor Kim Cooper from uh, the Division of Biological Sciences. Uh, she is an associate professor in the Cell and Developmental Biology section of biological sciences. She received her PhD in the lab of, am I, is it Dr. Cecilia, is it Moens or it is Moens? Uh, at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center uh, at the University of Washington, um, where she studied the genetics of hindbrain motor neuron specification and cellular behavior. Her interest in limb development and the diversity of form in animals drew her to a postdoctoral position with Dr. Cliff Tabin at the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. Work in her lab here at UCSD focuses on the mechanisms of limb evolution and on developing approaches to model such complex genetic traits in mice. Kim has received numerous awards, including the Packard Fellowship in Science and Engineering, the NSF Career Award, and Harvard University Certificate of Distinction in Teaching. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Cooper. Uh, and of course, after her presentation, we will open the floor for a Q&A that uh, our director, Suzanne Chaffee, will um, emcee. 
So take it away, Professor Cooper. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, so much for the introduction and for inviting me um, to speak to you all today. I, um, I like to start off in this sort of virtual forum by encouraging anyone who feels like it to keep your cameras on just because it helps uh, in this whole talking to the void world that we're in. Um, also, if you have any questions as I'm going along, don't hesitate to raise your hand or turn on your mic and, and ask. Um, if you need some clarification, I know we have um, faculty from very diverse disciplines, and so I've tried um, to make this talk as accessible as possible, um, but please ask questions. So I'm going to start off a bit um, by talking about my personal background. So um, I grew up in Texas, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we were about 20 minutes from the nearest movie theater. And so I was surrounded by an enormous amount of animal diversity. I've had some sort of personal contact with each animal um, on this slide. And then when I was a grad, or sorry, when I was an undergraduate student at Cornell, I was taking developmental biology classes. I became fascinated by the embryo, just as uh, the unfolding of, of all of these processes from a single cell to the adult, and decided to do my graduate studies um, on zebrafish hindbrain development, as was mentioned. And then towards the end of my PhD, kind of came back to this idea of the extreme diversity of animals, here focused now on just a group of mammals. And when, what I thought was really interesting, and what I decided to do for my postdoc, um, I thought it was really interesting that if you take each of these species and you remove the fur, the skin, the muscle, connective tissues, and reduce them down to just their bony skeletons, you can still recognize each of these species as distinct from one another. And um, I think that at least to sort of a genre level, you'd be able to identify each of these organisms if you had only the limb skeleton. And that's because natural selection acting in a variety of different environmental contexts has um, driven the elongation of the bat wing digits, for example, the reduction of the horse limb skeleton to a single toe, the severe reduction of the pelvic skeleton of a dolphin and the forelimb skeleton to a flipper. And so this is what I decided I wanted to study for my postdoc. And that was around 2006. And there were several labs that had taken various approaches to trying to study the evolution of the vertebrate limb skeleton in, in several different species. There were a couple of studies in pythons because even though we think of snakes as entirely limbless, there are some species that have a very vestigial pelvis and a tiny little femur. Um, there are these uh, Australian skink lizards, different species of which have different numbers of toes. The anolis lizards of um, the southeastern United States and the Caribbean islands that have had a, a radiation of, of limb forms and functions. This is um, a wallaby that has just an incredibly hot, uh, weird hind limb, if you want to look that up, and then the bat, of course. And so um, what I thought was really interesting about all of this, though, is that the, the closest relative on the slide to the laboratory mouse for which we know the most about the genetics of limb development is the bat. And despite the fact that bats look like winged rodents, they're actually 95 million years divergent. They're more closely related to dogs and dolphins than they are to mice. And we're more closely related to mice, despite the fact that that also goes quite back, deep back into the tree. And so at this time, there wasn't really an ideal system for studying um, the genetics of limb evolution using the mouse as your sort of most well-known reference species. And so what are the characteristics that you would look for if you were seeking that animal that would help you study evolution of the vertebrate limb? So, so I've already um, mentioned the close relationship to mice, but also not just the close relationship, but limbs that are very, very different. And so I sort of think of looking for mechanisms of the evolution of development as looking for a needle in a haystack. So the haystack is all of the evolutionary differences between species that have accumulated over millions and millions of years. And the needle is the thing that you're most interested in. 
And so if you can identify species that have a very, very big difference in the morphology you're interested in compared to mice um, and are otherwise very closely related, that's looking for a larger needle in a smaller haystack. Now, ideally, you'd also want this to be a small animal that can be raised in the laboratory um, for, for ease of experimental studies. And by my personal preferences, um, I was interested in species that are not threatened or endangered just because it's easier to access materials. And, um, and so the animal that I settled on as a postdoc is, is this creature. This is the lesser Egyptian jerboa, Jaculus jaculus. It's a completely naturally occurring animal. We did not make this in the laboratory. It diverged from mice about 50 million years ago, which also sounds like a long time ago, but these animals are actually more closely related to mice than are the desert kangaroo rats of the Southwestern United States that you might be familiar with. And so this is what they look like if you were watching them move in real life. Um, since we're all here in San Diego someday when we can be in person again, you are welcome to come and visit my lab and see the animals in person. They're, they are actually really remarkable. Um, they're what's considered obligate bipedal, which means they get around entirely upright on their hind legs. They do have hands, but they, they kind of keep their hands tucked up underneath their chin and they use them for feeding, um, for digging and for grooming. And so when most people look at these animals, the first question um, I think that comes to mind is why? Why did this animal evolve the way it is? What's unusual about this morphology that helps this animal to survive? And so before I answer that question, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the distribution of the species. There are actually 33 species of gerboas that are all bipedal rodents. Their full range distribution is represented by these two species. Um, so they're found in North Africa, throughout the Middle East and Central Asia, and then up into Northern and nor Northwestern China and Mongolia. And if you were to land on the ground, this is pretty much what their habitat looks like. So this is an image that I took once on a field collection um, in China. And it's really sparsely vegetated desert environment. And it's thought that these animals, that the origin of gerboas was around the time of India crashing into Asia um, with the uprising of the Himalayas and the desertification of Central Asia. And, um, and it, that's when it is thought that these animals evolved. And so we were interested in trying to identify mechanistically, why is it that these animals could have evolved this bipedality? What advantage did they get in this kind of environment? And so on my last field trip um, to China in 2012, um, a woman went with me who at the time was a graduate student at Harvard and is now faculty at the University of Michigan. This is Talia Moore. And so what we did is we landed, collected animals and put them into an enclosure and then filmed the animals with high speed cameras um, escaping a predator, which was me. So I chased them around and Talia did the filming. We had the bipedal gerboas and we had a quadrupedal sand rat as the sympatric species that lives in the same environment but gets around on all fours. And so here's the data from this study that was published in Nature Communications a few years ago now. And what we've done here is um, using a mathematical equation that allowed us to quantify entropy or unpredictability of the animal's trajectory. Um, and this is in, in frames of video, can we predict from one frame of video, what is gonna be the position and orientation of the animal in the next frame of video? And on the y-axis here is the time that the animal spends in the open center of the arena versus the periphery. And so if you've ever had mice in your house, as I did in Boston as a grad student before we got cats, you might walk into the kitchen and flip on the light and there's, if there's a mouse in the middle of the kitchen floor, it's gonna bolt for cover. And that's because these quadrupedal animals are quite predictable. They tend to run in a straight line. Their predators are animals that chase or intercept on a wing. And therefore the animals spend very little time if given the choice out in the open environment. Now contrasting that, what we thought was really interesting is that each of the two species of bipedal gerboas that we studied, 
are both less predictable in their locomotion and also spend more time out in the open field. And so the interpretation of this is that bipedality is associated with unpredictability and decreased open field anxiety. So the advantage would be that in the sparsely vegetated habitat, if there are bushes that the animals have for food and cover that are spaced out from one another, these animals can get from one bush to another bush more easily without getting eaten by a predator because they're less predictable. And therefore they also are more willing to be out in the open and search for food. And that would be an advantage in nutrient sparse environments. And so I have a video that illustrates this that we took on the side of the road on our way back from the field site once that I just think is a hilarious representation of this um, phenomena. And so you'll see that this animal is changing orientation very rapidly. It runs off into the dark for a bit. And then it'll come right back out into the road. So that's the advantage of bipedality. And so um, I was involved in this study in part because I'm interested in biological processes of multiple uh, levels of organization. And so um, what my lab primarily does is, oops. Okay. My lab's, my lab's primary research interest is in what are the morphological features and how do these morphological features develop to give rise to this really unique organism. Um, but I like to study that in the context of the biology in which they evolved. And so the features that they have evolved are the loss of the lateral digits. We have five fingers and by lateral digits, what I mean is that these animals have the three central toes, but they've lost the first and the fifth toes, which is evident here in this adult skeleton that I pulled out of a museum drawer. Um, they have fused these long bones on their feet, which are the metatarsals. So at birth, the animals have three distinct long bones in their feet that then fuse together into a single bone that trifurcates distally into the, each of the toes. They've entirely lost the intrinsic foot muscles that we have in our hands and feet that let you do more complex movements. And the Jerboa foot is re reduced essentially to a lever. And they have what you can appreciate in this juvenile animal that's sitting here in my hand, this dramatic elongation of the hind limb and particularly of the metatarsal. So this is the ankle of this animal and this is all foot. And because my lab is the first to study development in these uh, animals, we take sort of a, a multi-leveled hierarchical approach to this. First to understand what are these phenotypes um, in, at the level of tissues, tissue organization by comparison to the mouse as our reference species. Then when we understand what are the differences in tissue development, we get down to the level of cells. What are cell identities and behaviors that differ in the two species? And then we work to identify the genes that have expression that differs in the two species at the times that these differences in the cells and tissues are being established. And then because many of the same genes are responsible for development of the forelimb and of the hind limb, we don't think that it's gonna be the coding body part of the genes that make proteins that differ between species, but rather differences in the regulation of those genes, the instructions that say how much of a gene is gonna be expressed at a particular time in development and location. And so for the first part of this um, talk, I'm gonna focus on this phenotype of the elongation of these foot bones, the metatarsis. And so skeletal proportion, if you look at these three species, it's clear that skeletal proportion is integral to an animal's form and function. The kangaroo hop, human run, and bat flight are dependent to, to a large extent on differences in the proportion of the skeleton. It's also evident from looking at an individual over time, so a human embryo to adult, for example, where each of the sort of scaffolds that's gonna give rise to these adult bones starts off at a much more similar size in the early embryo and then differences in the rate and duration of growth establish uh, 
these extreme differences in the length of the short hand and foot bones compared to the long arm and leg bones. And so development of the skeleton is very modular. Evolution of the skeleton is also highly modular because you can see that in the bat, for example, the wing digits are disproportionately longer than the rest of the uh, skeletal elements. And I think that this is really fascinating because despite this clear modularity in the development and evolution of the skeleton, most coding mutations that affect the protein sequence of a gene cause proportionate dwarfism. And so what that means is that there's this toolkit of genes that are required for growth of the skeleton. And if you mutate that gene, the whole skeleton will shrink. And so we don't really yet know why it is that we have short hand and foot bones and long arm and leg bones, because it doesn't seem that we have hand genes and arm genes, for example, not many at least. And so the overarching sort of premise or hypothesis of this work is that skeletal proportion is an outcome of growth modularity. And if that's the case, is growth modularity then an outcome of cis regulatory modularity? And by, what, by that, what I mean is that there's a gene here that's needed throughout all of the skeleton for growth to occur. But then there are instructions encoded in that same piece of DNA that tell that gene to be expressed in the arm and then factors that bind to that to make that happen. And there are separate sequences and the factors associated with that that are active in the leg. And so you can get expression throughout the skeleton by sort of adding together arm expression and leg expression. But what that would give you is the ability for the leg to differ over evolutionary time by mutations that occur in these factors while the arm stays the same. And if that's the case, then what are these genes that have modular expression? And can we identify these instructions that give rise to the differences in modularity in the skeleton? So there are a variety of approaches to identify the genes that determine the different lengths of individual bones. You can take a quantitative trait locus or genome-wide association study, whereby you have a population of individuals and you look for sequences in the genome that associate with particular traits. And so you could look for sequences that associate with differences in proportion of the body of individuals in a population. But the problem, and this has been applied in humans in particular, but the problem with this kind of study, if you're looking for extreme differences is that proportion, while it does vary within individuals of population, it doesn't vary to the extent of an order of magnitude difference that we see in the long arm bones versus the short hand bones, for example. And so you could compare elements within an individual, you could compare the long arm bones to the short hand bones. But the problem there is that we know that each of these skeletal elements also has a distinct identity from one another that's controlled in part by these Hox genes, which are transcription factors that are expressed in segments of the skeleton. And because they're transcription factors, what they do then is to turn on and off a whole variety of differences in gene expression in each of these skeletons. And so the problem with that is that how would you then disentangle the difference in growth rate of these elements from the difference in intrinsic identity of these elements? And so a third approach, which is what we've taken, is to compare homologous elements between species that have different proportions. So by what I mean by homologous is the same foot bone in one species compared to the same foot bone in another species that's disproportionate to one another. And so that comes back now to this Jerboa versus mouse comparison. And so I'm gonna just start by telling you a little bit about the growth dynamics of these two species. On this graph, what we see is the length of the femur in millimeters plotted against the x-axis here, and the length of the metatarsus in millimeters in the y-axis. Each of these squares is an animal of increasing age for the mouse in blue and for the jerboa in red. And the first dots here are the animal lengths of these two skeletal elements at birth. And so what you can appreciate from this is that they are different, but not extremely different from one another at birth. And that within the first week after the animals are born, there's an acceleration of, of uh, growth in the hind limb of the jerboa compared to the mouse. And in the mouse, while the femur continues to grow until about 28, 28 days or so is the length 
of this animal or is the age of this animal. Um, the metatarsus stops growing by about two or three weeks. And so you get this sort of um, increasing length of the proximal skeleton of the femur while the foot stays small. Whereas in the gerboa, both the femur and metatarsus continue to grow and grow and grow until you get this outrageous adult proportion. And so there are two differences in these postnatal growth dynamics. There's an initial acceleration of growth that occurs in the gerboa and then a prolonged elongation of the skeleton um, for longer than the mouse. And so we chose um, a stage here during this early rate acceleration, partly because once growth slows in the mouse, the entire structure of, of the skeletal element changes its identity. Um, but at these earlier stages in both species, this distal part of the metatarsus um, is it represented here. So this is the gerboa foot. You see red is bone and blue stains the cartilage. And this growth cartilage right here is the site of all of the elongation. That's the business end of the elongating skeleton. And so what we did is to carefully dissect out this part of the metatarsus of the mouse and the gerboa five days after the animal is born when this rapid growth acceleration occurs in the gerboa. And this is the work of a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Adi Saxana. And the first thing that we needed to do, because we're looking at two different species that separated from a common ancestor about 50 million years ago, we needed to make sure we were comparing apples to apples. So for each gene in the mouse, we needed to know that we had the exact matching gerboa gene. And so we first annotated this set of about 17,000 exact matching genes in the two species so that we could compare the levels of expression directly between the two species. And when we did that, what we found is that the level of expression in the two species differs significantly for about 59% of the genes in the feet, which is an enormous number of genes. That is a huge chunk of the genome that's differentially expressed. And it's perhaps not surprising given 50 million years of divergence from a common ancestor. And if this is where we had to stop, there wouldn't be a story because that's too much to be able to disentangle what's causative. But the really nice thing about these species, as I mentioned, is that the forelimb of the gerboa is very similar to the forelimb of a mouse. And we think the toolkit that causes bones to grow is gonna be the same in different growth cartilages. And so what we did is look for differences in the forearm that are equivalent to the difference in the hind limb so that we can eliminate those genes from consideration. Because if they're equally different in the two locations, they can't explain the disproportionate elongation of the gerboa foot. And so this is that attempt. So here's what we've done is to plot the fold change, it's the log two of the fold change of the difference in expression in the forearms of the gerboa compared to the mouse on the x-axis here, and the log two of the fold change of the difference in expression in the metatarsis of the gerboa compared to the mouse. And what I want you to appreciate from this graph is that the slope of this line here is actually 0.977. There's an extremely high correlation in the expression differences in the two locations. And this is the 99% confidence interval of that line. And what that says is that a majority of the genes, if they're differentially expressed in the feet, they're equivalently differentially expressed in the arm, and we can eliminate those from consideration because they can't explain differential growth um, as, a, as a function of skeletal proportion. And so among these the different both locations, what we're left with is 241 genes differ in both locations, but they're not correlated between skeletal. And then there's another set of about 1500 genes that differ in the metatarsis of the two species, but not in the forearms. And so these genes are either not expressed in the forearm, so they can't differ there, but they differ in the feet. But there are also quite a large number of genes that are expressed in the forearms, but their expression doesn't differ there despite 50 million years of, se of separation. And their expression significantly differs in the feet. And so I'm gonna give you a punchline of what these genes have told us. 
which is that about 10% of the genes are associated with the disproportionate elongation of gerboa feet. And these include genes that have novel expression domains in the feet that might promote growth. And I've listed a few here, SHOX2, HOXB13, and PAX1 are genes that we found that are not expressed in mouse feet and they appear in gerboa feet. And we have reasons to believe that each of these genes might accelerate growth. What we found that we didn't express, expect is that there's evidence for latent growth potential in mouse feet. So there's evidence that there are mechanisms that actively repress growth in the distal limb. So there's potential there that's repressed. And there's evidence that these mechanisms of growth repression are alleviated in the gerboa feet. And so there could be combined mechanisms of growth activation and release from this uh, repression of latent growth potential. Now I'm gonna focus in on one example of these, which is SHOX2. And the reason for that, I got excited by this one because I knew, I knew this gene before I hovered my mouse over this data point and saw um, that, that it was present here. Uh, and it stands for short stature homeobox, and it's, it's number two. And that's because uh, the human ortholog of this gene is uh, mechanistically responsible for several short stature syndromes in humans, such as Langer syndrome, um, as an example. And its expression here is validated in the gerboa metatarsis. This is a growth cartilage in each of these dots is, is some RNA expression of shocks too. And you see it's absent from mouse metatarsis in our experiments. And this was, um, this data here, the absence of its expression in the mouse metatarsis confirms what had been previously published in mice, rats, uh, rabbits, humans, cats, et cetera. There are a large number of limbed vertebrate animals that have been looked at. And it's always expressed in the proximal limb skeleton and has never before been detected in the distal limb skeleton. And this is a wild type. This is a normal, genetically normal mouse with its skeleton. And this is um, the SHOX2 knockout. So the, the loss of function SHOX2 mouse has a dramatically shortened proximal limb skeleton where SHOX2 is expressed, but its distal skeleton appears to be fine. And so this shows that this gene SHOX2 is necessary for proximal limb bone growth in the mouse. And then our colleagues had this data literally sitting in a drawer for 10 years unpublished until they learned about our results and contributed this data to our paper, showing that when SHOX2 is misexpressed, when you force it to be expressed in the distal limb where it's not normally found in a mouse, that expression is sufficient to increase the length of hand and foot bones. So this is SHOX2 overexpressing hand and foot compared to mouse or to controls. So just qualitatively, you can tell that there's a difference in length here that's quantified below. So this was really cool. We have this gene that is appearing in the gerboa metatarsis that's both necessary and sufficient for bone length in the mouse. And coming back to this question about growth modularity, what are the mechanisms by which we could gain expression um, in the gerboa foot? And so to answer this question, we've taken an approach called attack seek whereby you use this mechanism to stick these colored bits here, this blue and red colored bits are adapter sequences that allow you to get the DNA sequence of a site in the genome that's accessible for this element to jump in. And so regions of the genome are accessible when they're open so that transcription factors can bind to them. So this kind of analysis helps us to identify which bits of the genome are being actively accessed for gene expression that might be these gene regulatory sequences. And so by amplifying and sequencing each of these little bits of DNA that's been cut up and tagged, we can map these then to the genome of our species and you get these pileups or peaks of represented bits of DNA that were sequenced at all of the places where it seemed the instructions were being read for that gene to be expressed. And what we found that was really exciting is an open chromatin peak in the Gerboa metatarsal that says this little bit of DNA is being accessed and used in the gerboa, but not in the mouse. And it lies near shocks too. 
And so this is evidence that there could be a new SHOX2 regulatory sequence in the Jerboa genome that's not being used in the mouse. And when we compared the genome of the Jerboa, which is represented here by this little bit, to the mouse genome, and then aligned that genome to all of these other representative vertebrate species, most of them are mammals, so from um, platypus up, these are all mammals. What we found is that this piece of 139 nucleotides of DNA, 139 bases of DNA, is represented by about 1,200 nucleotides in all of these other species. So there's a Jerboa lineage specific deletion of about one kilobase that makes this 139 base sequence that's newly accessible in this species. And so we think that maybe this deletion is responsible for the gain of a SHOX2 regulatory sequence and its subsequent expression in Jerboa metatarsis. That's the hypothesis that we're working with from now. And so one way to test that is to mechanistically ask, what is the effect of that deletion and the creation of this new 139 base sequence? So here, by example, and we're applying this to many loci, I'm using SHOX2 as, uh, as an example. So here's a representative mouse genome where you might have radius and ulnus or forearm sequences that are present, but no sequences that would drive expression of this gene in the foot. And in the Jerboa, it seems like it's gained this bit of DNA that would express uh, shocks two in the foot. And so what we'd like to do is swap that bit of DNA from the Jerboa genome into the mouse genome and ask what's the effect. So we create what my graduate student lovingly has termed the Jerbouse, which is a mouse with this hybrid Jerboa bit of DNA placed in its genome. And then we can ask what does this sequence that's present in the Jerboa and not in the mouse Due to the expression of SHOX2, is it sufficient to give us SHOX2 expression in the mouse metatarsis where it's not found? And can we get any aspect of a Jerboa like phenotype to appear in the mouse? But I've told you that Jerboas and mice separated from a common ancestor about 50 million years ago. And we know, and, and I actually not going to, given the time, spend a lot of time on this um, phylogenetic tree. But basically what we know from the difference in colors on these two trees is that the genetics that determine skeletal proportion are really complex. And the genetic mechanisms that determine the difference in forelimb, hindlimb length are different, not entirely overlapping the mechanisms that tell us the length of the foot with respect to the proximal limb, the femur. And so if we wanted to make a mouse that looks very much like a gerboa, we would probably have to make multiple changes in the genome to really push that phenotype to be more gerboa-like. But compound genotypes, so changes at multiple locations in the genome in a mouse, are a universal challenge to studying rodent genetics for modeling human disease and for being able to do um, drug design. And that's because keeping large numbers of animals is expensive. It takes a lot of time for grad students and postdocs to breed all these animals together, hoping for that one really rare genotype out of several hundred. And then you're euthanizing hundreds of animals that just got unlucky and didn't inherit your genotype of interest. And so can we overcome this problem? So as a quick primer on Mendelian inheritance. So this is if you have ever taken genetics, even in an introductory biology course, you've heard of probably of Mendelian inheritance. That's our standard mechanism of inheritance. And so by this um, stripped down example, there's a gene here that has two variants, one that makes the mouse black, one that makes the mouse gray. And if you have um, one of each of these, the mouse would be black. You mate this black mouse to this black mouse with the same genotype. And when all of these things assort into their offspring, one quarter of the individuals will inherit two copies of that gray variant and make a gray animal. But what if we could engineer genes that copy themselves from one copy to two copies in the genome? So they basically replace the one that you uh, is less desired. Then in theory, you could achieve 100% of offspring that have the preferred version of the gene. And you can imagine that if we could do this at one gene, 
and another and another and another that would rapidly accelerate the pace of making these, these really complex mouse genotypes. The way that this works using CRISPR is to target the non-preferred version of the gene for a double-stranded DNA break. So it just goes in and snips the, the DNA where you want to replace that copy. And then these double-strand DNA breaks can be repaired essentially in two different ways. They can be sloppily stuck back together. Those make mutations. So if you've ever heard of CRISPR being used to mutagenize a genome, that's using the sort of sloppy sticking together mechanism. Or if you have a template sequence that has some similarity, it can copy information into that cut that wasn't previously present. And we know that this sort of um, homology directed repair, the sort of using template sequence works if you have lots and lots and lots of bits of DNA that you've injected in with your CRISPR machinery. So this is one of the ways that we get um, targeted insertions of pieces of DNA in mice or cells or a variety of other species. But the question we wanted to ask is that, can you get genotype conversion? So can you go from a heterozygous individual that has one copy of your allele of interest, of your variant of interest, make a DNA double-strand DNA break in the other chromosome and get information to copy? So this is going from one copy of the variant to two copies of the variant on, on the chromosomes. If you've heard of the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society and efforts on this campus to develop gene drives and in insects, this is the system that works efficiently in flies and mosquitoes. And this forms the foundation of these CRISPR gene drive over multiple generations. And that's because if you release a small number of individuals that have this kind of copying mechanism, as that is inherited at a high frequency in a population, that variant will rise to saturation in that population. And if it tanks the fertility of the animals, then the number of mosquitoes will decline. These kind of approaches have also been proposed to eliminate invasive rodents on islands. This is a huge problem for island ecology because they're a small percentage of Earth's land mass but they represent a very large fraction of extinct bird, uh, amphibian, and mammal populations. And most animal extinctions that occur on islands are due to invasive populations of mice and rats that really had no business being there other than the fact that they've been carried over by human activities. And so we wanted to just test in the laboratory whether this kind of a mechanism could work in mice. And what we did is we engineered this transgene, a piece of DNA that we inserted into the mouse genome, and we inserted this copycat transgene, transgene into the gene called tyrosinase that is normally responsible for the black pigmentation in mice. And so if you disrupt this gene, they're white. And that's just because we chose this gene because then it makes it easy to see the readout of what we've done to the animals by inheritance. This bit of DNA that we inserted into the tyrosinase gene, that includes this little bit of the guide RNA that's needed to target the site that's gonna be cut, which is the same site that was used to insert this piece. So this um, can never be cut again by this, this guide RNA, but the wild type, the intact version of this gene can. And it also encodes this M cherry, which is a red fluorescent protein, to track the inheritance of this piece of DNA. And so if this animal is crossed to another animal that doesn't express Cas9, that doesn't have a gene for Cas9, it's inherited normally, and it cannot cut in the genome. But if this cross includes a gene that encodes for Cas9, then when the transgene that has the guide RNA comes together with the gene that will express the Cas9 protein, those two together will complex, this guide RNA and the Cas9 protein will come together in the intact chromosome here and they'll make a cut, okay? 
So then the question is, what happens at that cut? Is this cut repaired by this interchromosomal exchange of information to copy that copycat element from one copy in the genome to the other chromosome so that now that there are two copies to be inherited? And so to distinguish if that were to copy over, these two chromosomes might look the same. And so to distinguish the donor from the recipient, we marked the recipient chromosome so that we could detect even a single incidence of success with the strategy. And then in the next generation, we identified offspring that inherited this chromosome. And so the next generation is a cross of these animals where we're asking, we're trying to find out what happened to this chromosome here. We cross these animals to mice that have a different mutation in the same gene that causes these animals to be albino. So it disrupts that gene. And now we're looking for individuals that have this chromosome together with one of these chromosomes. And there are three outcomes of this kind of cross. If nothing happens to this chromosome, if it's intact, then this animal will be black. If a mutation was made, but this copycat transgene didn't correct that mutation, then you have uh, a white mouse that does not fluoresce red. But if this whole transgene was copied over into the recipient chromosome, these animals will be white and they'll fluoresce red with that marked recipient chromosome. I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any questions. Not at this point. Okay. So I'm gonna give you kind of a broad summary of what we found. We've attempted multiple strategies to do this in the early mouse embryo and in the male and female germlines. And what we've learned is that in mice, it's complicated. And this is the work um, primarily of my graduate student, Hannah Grunwald, that defended in December, and we'll be starting her postdoc soon. So genotyping 3,000 animals, eight different crossing strategies. What we discovered is that there is no homology-directed repair in the early embryo. So those animals inherited a lot of mutations, but we didn't get this copying mechanism occurring in the early embryo. When we used um, strategies to make this Cas9 protein come on in the male germline, we got lots and lots and lots of mutations. So EJ here, these are all, 100% of these individuals inherited a mutation, but none of them inherited that red fluorescent transgene that we were trying to copy over to the other chromosome. But in the female germline, we had moderate copying from donor into recipient chromosome, averaging about 44% in the best strategy, which increased the, the frequency of inheriting this transgene from 50% that you would originally expect to 72% of the offspring of these females, which is awesome. Why did it work only in females and not in males? We think that's because the chromosomes are aligned and the mechanism of DNA damage repair favors information exchange during meiosis in mice. So meiosis is the process of making sperm and eggs. And what normally happens during meiosis is you get homologous recombination, which is the shuffling of the maternal and paternal genomes. And so that's why your children are not exact copies of, of you. Part of the reason why. They're not exact copies of your parents, rather. Um, and this process of meiosis, it happens earlier in female germline development than it does in males. And so we think in the male germline, we got a lot of mutations that happened before meiosis was initiated. And in females, these cuts are made closer to meiosis and this genotype conversion could occur. And so another graduate student in the lab, Alex Weitzel, has taken a, a new strategy to see if we can improve the efficiency by timing this Cas9 expression more um, precisely within meiosis. And that's by putting Cas9 
in this gene called SPO11 that has really, really um, tight expression during meiosis in the male and female germline. This is a mouse ovary. It's a section of a mouse ovary. And in green here, you can see expression from this transgene. And in um, purple or magenta, this is a gene that's expressed only in germ cells. So we can, we're confirming that we have germ cell expression in the female ovary. And similarly in the male testes, there's lots and lots and lots of expression in these meiotic cells of the male testis. So this is the data from our prior strategy where we got all mutations in the male and some genotype conversion to occur in females. And what we see by this newer strategy using the SPO11 Cas9 is we've, we've identified homology-directed repair, these genotype conversion events that are occurring in the male for the first time. So timing to meiosis worked to get genotype conversion to occur in the male. But in both the male and in the female, all of the rep repair types are much less frequent. So a majority of these bars, most of the animals from these crosses had no mutations, no copying. So, so much less repair. But as a proportion of these DNA repair types in females, it's similar to our prior strategy. It's just, it seems that we got much, much less cutting at this site. And we think that's because our prior strategy, just the animals were making more of this Cas9 protein than they are in this strategy. They're making much less of it, though it's more precisely timed. And so what we think that means is that the timing and level of Cas9 are both likely critical for efficient genotype conversion to occur. So if it's before meiosis one is too early and later in meiosis one or after that is gonna to be too late. And so what we wanna do is more precisely time meiosis one, but at, or time two meiosis one, but at high levels of expression to get lots of, of breaks in the DNA during that critical window for this conversion to occur. We think drug inducible systems might work for that, but we can inject a drug at a precise time and get lots of expression. And so the um, conclusion from this is that we've learned a lot about this mechanism and how it works in mice and some really interesting things about the biology of mice that are different from insects where it was much easier to get efficient genotype conversion. And from what we've learned, we think we're closer to systems that could work well in the lab. But especially if we have to do something drug inducible to really pinpoint this timing, that's not gonna work in the wild. So systems that might address the loss of biodiversity will take more time to be able to engineer strategies that are simply genetic and don't require any sort of intervention by a researcher. And with that, I'm gonna thank everybody in my lab. The first part of what I talked about was the work of Adi Saxena, um, this last part on genotype conversion. Uh, was two graduate students in the lab, Hannah Grunwald and Alex Weitzel. I want to thank all of my collaborators everywhere, my funding sources. If anyone would like to reach out to me, here's my email address. Thank you for being here and for your time. We know this was a fair bit to chew on for um, people in the non-science disciplines, perhaps, but I'm excited to take any questions that you have. <laughs>